It's the end of the world as we know it. But I feel fine. Back in 1987, REM predicted that the world was going to come to an end, but fortunately, they were wrong about that. Now there are new apocalyptic predictions, and we'll talk about our own on this week's episode of The Point. Welcome back to The Point. I'm your host, Anna Kasparian. And you know, I like to bring a little versatility to this program. Last week, we ta talked about gaping holes in pornography. But today, we're going to talk about something a little more substantive than that. We're going to talk about the end of the world and the apocalypse. Uh, but before we get to that, let's meet our panelists for this week's Point. Uh, first, we have Lee Camp. He is a political comedian and activist famous for going on Fox News and calling the network quote, a parade of propaganda and a festival of ignorance. His popular web series is called Moment of Clarity and is now free to download on LeeCamp.net. I hope you didn't waste all your best material on the Jimmy Dore show because, okay, Jimmy Dore show is pretty good, but this one's also pretty good. I you did. You gotta bring it. But I, I saved you some mediocre stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Desi Doy, and you guys are all familiar with her now, but for those of you who are not, she is the co-host and managing editor of the nationally syndicated Green News Report at bradblog.com, billed as the most scintillating six minutes in Green News. Uh, she's also a favorite here at TYT uh, with the Point audience, um, and Desi, uh, Everyone wants to know what your secret is. Everyone is in love with you. So I don't have a secret. I just show up because you just guys have me lovable. show up here. So hi. <laughs> All right. And Mark Thompson is a two-time uh, Emmy Award winning uh, or winner for writing, hosting and producing specials for Fox Television. Fox Television. Uh, he's also been the voice of a number of well-known programs, including a little-known show called American Idol. Yeah, that not was a, a big good one. deal. Yeah. Not a big deal. No. Um, he has also recently uh, reached a career high by co-hosting on The Young Turks on Current TV. It is true. No, uh, I do love The Young Turks. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, but I wanted the porn show, but apparently <laughs> you couldn't find my number, so I end up on this show. No, this is it's really. I'm really looking forward to this. It's gonna be a lot of fun. All right. Well, we're gonna have a lot of fun on today's program, and I want to get right to our very first point, actually. And this point has to do with overpopulation. Is overpopulation a real problem in this country or in this world? Is it having a huge impact on climate change? Well, let's get to our first point, which is on overpopulation. Is overpopulation a made-up controversy, or is it a real? issue that we should delve into. Well, Tom Hartman talks about this issue in more detail in the next video. Let's watch. Hi, Tom Hartman here. In the last 24 hours, just in the last 24 hours, 45,000 people have died on planet Earth of hunger, 36,000 of them children. In the last 24 hours, 144,000 acres of rainforest have been cut down, the lungs of our planet. Last night, 70,000 children went to bed hungry right here in America. We have too many people around the planet and too few resources. And here's an important piece of information everyone should know and most people don't. When women have equal educational opportunity and equal political power with men, population stabilizes. It's not access to birth control that stabilizes population uniquely, although it is important. And it's not access to, to money. There are some very wealthy countries and countries where birth control is readily available, where population is still exploding. What it's really about is equality. In those countries where women have come close to equal power to men, like Iceland and Sweden, population growth stabilizes. In those countries where women are second-class citizens, population explodes. So what does that tell us? Here in the United States, we should be demanding, first of all, that our Congress, at the very least, be half women through legislation if necessary. And we need to support education of girls and political power for women worldwide. If we're going to have any kind of foreign policy at all, that should be at the top of it. A psychiatrist friend of mine once pointed out to me that, in his opinion, the most dangerous drug in the world is not cocaine, not heroin, it's testosterone. The most important environmental movement on the planet right now is the international women's rights movement. Let's all help with women's equality before it's too late. Tag, you're it. Now, Tom Hartman brings up a pretty controversial issue. A lot of people get a little antsy when you bring up the issue of overpopulation. But Mark, before we actually get to some of the solutions that Tom mentioned in that video, let's talk about the validity of his argument. Uh, do, is overpopulation a real problem that we should tackle? I mean, if you look at the resources on planet Earth and you look at the, the population stresses on those resources, yeah, it's a real problem. Uh, the reason I have an, uh, an issue with this issue 
is I just don't really know what can be done aside from the more elevated viewpoint, which I think he takes at the end of the video, which is that remarkable statistic about women's rights and, and, and that equality. I, it, 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 that's fascinating, and that's probably maybe one of the limitations on this, uh, on this problem. You have to find those solutions because I don't really think any other solutions are, are feasible. But what, I mean, really, what, what are we supposed to do? Yes, so stipulated, we have more people on the planet than uh, the resources can provide for. Uh, really, what's the solution? There's no way to shoot your way out of that, if you will. Uh, I mean, that metaphorically. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I really think, so you have to find creative solutions of the sort that he just mentioned, I suspect, because I just don't know where else you go. Now, it's interesting because, uh, of course, you guys are all aware of a draconian solution to the problem. For instance, China has the one-child policy um, that has actually led to more uh, boys than girls right, being born. Right, look what's happened there. Yeah. That's been a, that's been a, a horror. 116 of boys. Consequences. Right. 116 boys for every, uh, you know, 100 girls. So it is a bit of a problem. Um, but, you know, th the whole issue of equality kind of plays into... Uh, reproductive rights, doesn't it, Desi? Do you think that that could be a real solution to this? Yes, now this is a, something that you and I have talked about before, mm -hmm. is it's this desire to control women's fertility. And there is a place for that. There is a mechanism for that, as Tom mentioned in his video as well, that there is an important part of family planning services, but they have to be voluntary, because then when you get into these issues of, you know, oh, these are eugenics, these people who want to talk about controlling the population, uh, you know, when you get into voluntary policies, when you actually provide women around the world with birth control access, with access to health care as well, and the education, you know, that's part of elevating the status of women. It's a portion of it, the birth control and fertility control. You know, that that actually does lower the fertility rate. We have the data now to let us know this. Mm -hmm. I'd like to expand it a little more, though, is that I think we don't actually have a population problem. What we have is a consumption problem. You know, that if everybody on the world, in the world, gets raised up to a, an American middle class level of lifestyle, we don't have the resources, the natural physical resources in the earth to meet that uh, requirement. Right. So it's not an overpopulation problem, it's an oversized population problem. Well, it's our, also, our people yeah. are gigantic. <laughs> I mean, for, America, for, every, yes. for every obese yeah. kid, think two skinny kids don't have a place to stand. You know, so it's, and, and also you, you, you have the problem uh, that that representative told us about recently with Guam, where it could tip over because of too many people on it. So <laughs> our America, with all our obese people, could sink soon, I think, if we're not careful. Well, you know, I don't yeah. think the whole world would cry about that. But, <laughs> you know, but when you talk about consumption, you know, we are running up against the sort of the natural physical limits of the earth and its ability to restore the natural resources that we're burning through at a much faster clip than they can be replaced. So I think you know, when you start with the consumption issue in rich nations, when you look at, say, the consumption of a child in Bangladesh, one of the data that you guys sent was children in Bangladesh, one child in Bangladesh uh, uses 1 69th or emits 1 69th of the carbon dioxide of one American child. I like that you brought up that it's a consumption issue. And Lee, you made a big point about Americans being large. I, I'm sure both figuratively and literally. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the reason for that is L we have- Living large, maybe. We are living large. And you know, there was a recent study that you guys are all familiar with. We have discussed it on the show before that uh, basically indicated that we waste, here in the United States, 40% of the food that's available to us, right? And then in the meantime, we talk about how there are limited resources for people that live in poorer countries. But even if we did solve the issue of overconsumption here in the United States, do you guys really believe that it would help uh, solve the issue of overpopulation? Do you feel that people can continue having as many children as they ha they're having in you know, uh, more, uh, I would say, uh, disadvantaged countries, not like the United States where it's industrial, you have all of the resources you want? Um, can we still solve the problem just by consuming less? I think it has to be a... Um a multifaceted approach. You know, you have to have the consumption issue in rich countries where you know where we're burning through all of our, our resources. But you also have to put into your foreign aid policies the uh, assistance for women. You know, anything that helps to elevate the status of women, as Tom mentioned. You know, which is the healthcare, education, uh, educating girls, especially because we already know from you know data, decades of data, that these things actually work. It's a lot different from the 1970s mm -hmm. when there was the population explosion in India and we didn't have uh, you know wide. Um, wide deployment of birth control access. You know, we know that those policies that were tried in the 50s, 60s, and 70s don't really work, but now we have that data to say, oh, this stuff works. So if we do this, 
if we both take care of consumption from rich countries and help developing nations to develop in a more sustainable and efficient way, then we can actually help to solve these problems without resorting to draconian mm -hmm. uh, forced fertility policies. Th that makes total sense. The problem is that we are, and I'm talking about Western culture now, we are exporting that culture to the rest of the world yes, at, at a rate that's unbelievable. And the reason for it, of course, is money. Because uh, these corporate interests have, an, have, have the great monetary interest in getting that culture out there so that we can get the rest of the world big fat loads like we are. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I do mean big fat loads, again, as, a, as really a, a, a symbol of American consumption. I don't mean it literally. I'm, I, I know we are literally heavier, but I mean we do live with, with a boat and three cars and big highways and consumption, consumption, consumption. Right. And as it plays itself out in the, on the planet, as we export that culture and we romanticize it through our media and, right. and, and in all of these other ways, and these are very, very powerful tools, this kind of consumption is being reflected in, in some of these expanding and, cultures. So that when they go from third world to first world, they're going to be picking this all up. And, and the, uh, again, the law of unintended consequences, fossil fuel consumption and, and, and the rest. And it's not just about consuming so much, it's also about like the amount of resources that go into creating one McDonald's hamburger, you yes. know? Or right. the, the fact that, what is it, three bottles of water is used, to the amount of three bottles of water is used to make, to, to create one bottle of water. Right. Like, it's just an insane, bottle, inefficient exactly. process. It makes zero sense. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, water is, a, uh, is something you don't hear a lot about, but uh, in addition to all the problems in terms of finding uh, uh, minerals and, and, and additional fuel, and of course all of these uh, new ways we have to, to find and mine fuel is, uh, it, it are incredibly expensive and they give off more uh, greenhouse gases than, than, than is justified actually in, in the fuel you're going to get. But water will be a massive issue here in the next 20 yeah. years. You know this, Desi, oh, yeah. you're talking about. I mean, just the issues around water, and you talk about a, a resource that is obviously necessary. I mean, you can cut back on fossil fuel consumption, but water is one of those things that's a critical... Well, so this is the positive side of hydraulic fracking, is if all of our tap water is flammable, people will use less. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, see, there's another see? unintended yeah. consequence. Well, Thank you, Lee, Lee, Lee brings yes. up another great point. You know, uh, recently there was this report in the New York Times about how in North Dakota, where they produce the most Jerum wheat, um, they're having a hard time uh, keeping the climate the right temperature so they can continue growing it. And of course this has to do with uh, uh, climate change. Um, but another <coughs> thing that they've started doing more of in North Dakota is fracking. And of course people who are um, advocates of the environment are saying like, okay, we're using uh, unbelievable amounts of fresh water to pump it into the ground and bring up this natural resource, um, it's not realistic and we're robbing future generations of fresh water, something that will be a limited resource. So, so many different uh, issues come to play. But, I mean, uh, as I'm reading about this, I'm wondering, you know, it, it's kind of a chicken or egg uh, situation, right? Because um, is, is climate change going to cause this problem to uh, become more serious or are, are or is the overpopulation issue accelerating the rate of climate change? Because also keep in mind, in the United States, we're barely replacing um, uh, our population. <coughs> uh, less people are having kids. Back in the 1960s, each woman had about 3.9 kids. Now it's about, uh, uh, it, it's much more than that, it, uh, less than that, I'm sorry, it's about two children per woman. So we're barely replacing our population. But in third world countries, it's a little different. Just to give you guys an idea, uh, the highest birth rates from five to more than six births per women are occurring in a handful of nations in Africa and Asia, including Nigeria and Yemen. Um, so in the US, we're con consuming the most. We're, we're causing the most damage when it comes to the planet. Um, and then these poor populations aren't really doing that. So do you see population control as a way of the richest countries trying to control the population of the poorest? I think it's a convenient uh, policy for folks that don't wish to look at sustainability or look at, say, in a rich country like America. They don't want to consider the idea that they might have to go to something a little more efficient, maybe waste quite a bit less than they're wasting now. So it's much easier to look at a poor country and say, hey, you guys are the ones that need to change, not us. Mm -hmm. We're not the problem. But as you bring up climate change and the fact that we are overusing all of our natural resources at a clip we cannot replace them at, 
all of these threads are going to come together. You know, they may not come together at exactly the same time, but we are approaching sort of the natural limits of our entire system. Our economic system, global economic system, is based on unlimited growth. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the Earth just cannot sustain that. So I think it's going to be twofold. We have to, on the rich country side, the developed country side, work on uh, making our processes more sustainable and in line, and then assist developing countries as they lift their people out of poverty, mm -hmm. assist them in skipping over all the crap that we did and all the stuff that we dumped into the atmosphere, and help them get, sort of jump over that, that aspect of development and get to where we're all, we're all actually participating in a system that is sustainable and efficient. Because we have to, we'll have no choice. Actually. Isn't it a little difficult though to convince other countries that hey yeah we lived in excess and we had all of these great luxuries yeah, uh, but you guys can't do that you right. know, we got yeah. 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 a very very tough place it's like telling yeah. your kids hey I know you know I drink a lot but but alcohol is bad for you I mean you just can't do it. I mean we really we've been the the fat man at the all-you-can-eat buffet and now we're saying hey you know we're gonna close the buffet down you should close it down no it, 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 it's it, it's tough and and by the way even if we just if we don't try to get that message out necessarily, if we would tend our garden more responsibly. Right. I mean, we really haven't gotten to that. We haven't given up the all-you-can-eat buffet. We are, we are ignoring these massive issues. You've just uh, mentioned a few of them. I mean, this culture is in tr uh, trouble. I don't mean to be a doomsday, uh, and I know we're gonna talk about actual doomsday, <laughs> uh -huh. but um, I do think that you know, we, need to, we, need to, we need to tend our own garden. We need to be responsible about our consumption. And, and, and we need to teach the next generation to be more responsible than we were. We should do that here before we worry about, hey, you know, we should start wagging the finger at India or wherever. Well, and the, and the, and the, the saddest thing is this, the, the, the harsh effects of climate change and, and the problems we're talking about are going to hit these poorer countries hardest first. Yes. Yeah. Meanwhile, we'll have the money to rise above it even more easily. And for the uh, uh, obese children and overconsumption there is we could have an obesity exchange program where we <laughs> ship some of our little land manatees over to the other developing countries. They ship back their heroin chic kids, right? And then we could <laughs> fatten up their kids with our traditional diet diet of deep fried Skittles and chocolate Good. covered butter or whatever the fuck yeah. we eat. It's, yeah. better. it's better than what we're doing now. Like that. that could be, a, that's a, I see that as a six episode series on A&E where we, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. all right, are you with yeah. me on that? Yeah. I'm just pitching. All right. Yeah. By the way, I, uh, at the risk of going way over time on this segment, I have to ask one last question because there are so many different factors at play when it comes to this issue. And of course, educating women and giving them reproductive rights is one of the key solutions to this problem. So how do you fight back against religious fundamentalists that don't want to give women those rights? I mean, we're trying to fight against religious fundamentalists right now as we speak, and obviously it's a losing battle. So how can the U.S. Uh, successfully spread the education and reproductive rights that women here in the U.S. are kind of enjoying, but their you know their rights are about to get violated too with all of the crazy legislation that continues to get proposed by Republicans. I think it's a financing issue. You know, when when we take on as uh, the developed world, not just the United States, but when we all work together with the other developed countries to increase financing so that these programs can uh, actually be put into the places where they're needed. You know, we. We have plenty of food in the world, we just don't have it in all the right places. So that's one of the issues, you know, we could work together, you know, that's part of what the United Nations does, is works together mm -hmm. to mobilize public and private financing to try to make these policies work in different countries and work with the culture of those countries. And it's, it's something that just takes time, but it also takes a lot of money. All right, Desi, I'm going to let you have the last word on that segment, but we will have another great segment when we come back from our break. We're going to discuss disaster relief. Why don't we focus more on prevention as opposed to relief? And how can we use some of the more recent disasters to convince people that climate change exists? We'll be back. Welcome back to The Point. Our next point is a video by Naomi Klein, uh, the author of Shock Doctrine. And uh, during a recent talk, she was asked about Hurricane Sandy and whether or not uh, the reconstruction efforts for Hurricane Sandy represents an opportunity to usher progressive change. Here's part of her answer. I wouldn't call it disaster socialism. Um, in, in the piece you're referring to, I called it a people's shock as opposed to the shock doctrine. Um, 
And the truth is, what I, what I argue in the book, what I argue in the shock doctrine, is that this whole strategy was developed by the right in response to the fact that crises, are, uh, economic crises, and also ecological crises, in fact, are traditionally opportunities for the left. The problems that I call out in the book are not responding strongly to disaster. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're having a crisis, you should respond strongly. Uh, it, 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 deser it deserves that. It's these particular ways of using crisis in, in anti-democratic ways to hoard power, to centralize power, to circumvent democracy. So what I'm calling for is the opposite of that, is, is in moments of crisis to broaden the democratic space. And often the affected people are treated as so traumatized and so victimized that they of course could not participate in the reconstruction process themselves. And this is simply not true. In fact, the best way to recover from a trauma is to overcome your helplessness by participating, by helping. And that's what you see in the extraordinary Occupy Sandy response to, 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 to this particular crisis. And volunteers involved in Occupy Sandy are coming in in the, in the spirit of what they called mutual aid, which is saying, asking people, what do you want, you know, what, what, and trying to empower communities, not only to respond to the immediate emergency, but also the recovery afterwards. And it's amazing to me that here we have a crisis which was supposed to be a wake-up call about climate change. And it was a wake-up call for a little while. You know, you had the Bloomberg cover, it's global warming stupid. You had Bloomberg endorsing Obama because of, because of his supposed stand on climate change. Um, but yet, when we think about uh, reconstruction, we're talking about you know how to hold back the next storm, not how to prevent uh, the storms from continuing to escalate. And in the midst of all of this, what is happening in the city? But a serious discussion about raising transit rates is saying not only do you not want fare increases, but you but 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 but. Public transit in a moment like this should be free. We should be developing policy that is designed to encourage the maximum number of people not to use cars and to use public transit, right? Um, that's just one example of, of, of what, in my view, a people's shock would look like. And that involves mobilizing communities. It involves organizing the people in public housing who still don't have their, their lights on to be a political force. We have to organize neighborhoods. We have to organize, you know, we have to organize people around housing issues around debt issues, or, you know, organized transit users um, and, and, and these other constituencies because the traditional workforce, the large-scale workforce that, that gave birth to the labor movement, you know, it, it is not as, as present in our economy as it used to be, which is not to say labor unions are irrelevant. They're not irrelevant, but they can't be the only body that organizes mass numbers of people, the only institution. All right, Desi. Well, I want to start with you. Do you think what uh, Naomi Klein is calling for here is realistic? And do you feel that uh, Hurricane Sandy was a catalyst for climate change awareness? I think it was definitely a turning point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a study that came out, a poll or rather, that came out uh, earlier this month that said now 69% of New Yorkers believe that Sandy was either caused by or greatly influenced by climate change. So it has. You know, natural disasters do have the, uh, the outcome of focusing the mind and focusing the attention on these issues that people often thought, oh, that's not going to happen to us. Oh, it's a problem for people in poor countries, or it's a problem that's not going to happen for decades. And they're finally sort of seeing what scientists have been talking about for decades, which is we're going to see more frequent, intense, extreme weather events that are going to impact all of our infrastructure, especially on the coastlines. So this we now know, mm -hmm. and we now know that natural disasters are really expensive. And so, hey, here's an idea. Why don't we pay the cost to prepare ourselves for what we know is company, coming rather than pay the cost of repairing it and doing it exactly the way d we did before where it's still just as vulnerable. And that second cost far exceeds the first cost. It that does. is the, the cost of preventing is going to uh, be less than the cost that will be incurred uh, once repair. it's happened. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, and you're seeing it played out in New York right now. The problem is politically, it's tough to sell prevention, right? As a politician, it's uh, Bloomberg may be the only guy who's, you know, who's... I don't know. We did it in Iraq. We got, uh, well, there you go. Well, and we by bombed the, Iraq for prevention. No, and, and by <laughs> the way, look, you could, you could argue that the entire Bush uh, rant that was played out with all of these incursions into the Middle East, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and other places in which we have special forces and the like, 
that's all on a, a crusade for, for a fight against terrorism. But So, so I, I, I'm with you on that. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, similarly, it's a shame that we can't turn this tide, if you'll pardon the expression here, uh, uh, to, toward activism. I mean, she makes a really great point. I mean, when, when she talks about the fact that that was an opportunity lost, if you could have gotten that, that the people who use mass transit to expand even by 10 percentage points or even a smaller amount, every incremental step would, would help. Uh, but anyway, the political point I was making was simply that, uh, obviously, if you're a politician, it's very hard to, to mm -hmm. sell prevention because people want results of whatever your policy is now. But What's you know, a, well, sorry. sorry, I just want to comment on that very quickly. Um, what's amazing about that, and, and you know, to, to Lee's point as well, it's amazing that it's politicians are so effective when it comes to fear mongering, when it comes to potential threats from abroad. Right. But right. Why, why are they not effective in fear mongering when it comes to an actual threat, which is climate change? I mean, the extreme weather. And you know, to your point about the 69% of New Yorkers that believe that this is caused by climate change or man-made or uh, human activity, what happened to the other 31%? Like, wake the up, because okay? You, because you don't, uh, I think it's because you don't have the corporate elite behind that that message. You have it behind war, you mm -hmm. have it behind bombing, but you don't, and oil, but you don't have it behind something that is truly important, like like doing something about climate change. But even the 69% who say that, that we believe that it has something to do with climate change, all right, now let's, let's translate that to, now what percentage of those people are willing to incur a small tax so that we can build levees, so we can reduce uh, carbon emissions, so that we can, uh, there are things that, uh, preventive type measures all of a sudden, well, uh, I believe it's climate change, but isn't there another way besides me having to be taxed? I mean, uh, and by the way, Monday Night Football's on in a few minutes, so I got to, I mean, that's but really the culture taxes, that, you know. It's not just taxes, this could also be jobs, creating the, the wind farms or the solar sure, farms. Like, sure. like uh, these could be jobs for people. It's not just taxes. It's not, that's the only, not the only way to solve it. For some reason, we always seem to think jobs can only be created in things that are going to destroy the environment or, or military things, you know, the XL pipeline. That's the only place there's jobs. It's right. big oil right, pipelines. Right, but well, there's jobs. This, other places. Yeah, but all of this stuff that you bo both have just said deals with the corporate media mm -hmm. and the, infu the influence of the corporate media in determining the national conversation and determining the acceptable solutions and policy outcomes and determining what people think about, talk about, what they hear when they're driving to their kids to school. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we have that as a major component of something that has to be adjusted and changed. And when you've got somebody like Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Cuomo of New York both saying, we got to do this. We need the money for this we're going to plan to rebuild with sustainability and resilience in mind and we're going to do this they can actually leverage quite a bit of political will I think it depends on what uh, Naomi was saying is if the people actually come in and agitate and organize for this as well I mean, I think about what's happened historically when it comes to climate change and when it comes to <laughs> politicians that were advocates for, you know, uh, conserving uh, to being uh, responsible members of this planet so we don't destroy it. I mean, Jimmy Carter was one of those people. He was the first to put the solar pla panels on the White House. And then Ronald Reagan comes <laughs> in and you rips them right off, you know. And of course, Jimmy Carter was made fun of for that. And, then, and the same thing happened with Al Gore. Look, Al Gore uh, is one of the biggest advocates of uh, raising awareness for climate change and and I feel like he gets uh uh, criticized far too often well, in the mainstream media. Allowing the right wing to control the dialogue, like right. we should have made them look like complete assholes for for going after Al Gore right. or for the environment or whatever. And it goes back to the main issue of money in politics, money controlling our media. I love that you guys brought up the media issue because every once in a while you'll watch CNN or you'll watch some other mainstream network and you'll realize like, wait, why was there an ad for BP? What is BP trying to sell me right now? They're not trying to sell you anything they're just trying to buy off these uh, you know uh, yeah, right. networks to make right. sure that they don't get negative coverage and, and that's the reason this doubt on climate change has lasted so long is because so many of these networks are like well we have the guy who's talking about climate change and then we have the guy who says it's not real all right well if you look at the I don't know if you've seen the recent pie chart that's like 13,000 yeah. scientific you know backed uh, uh, researches research papers on these on climate change and then it's like 13 have said it's not real or something like that it's out amazing. of 13,000 yeah. it's like and it's like the and media creation. needs to so there, you can't, point, there's no you, two sides, yeah. yeah. Why do you dignify the other side? Uh, I couldn't agree more. But, and, and by the way, just because you mentioned the BP ads, mm -hmm. every time I see one of those BP ads, I get so pissed off because right. what was done in the Gulf with the Deepwater Horizon was, a, was an obscenity. But then beyond that, the, the way that they have re-entered the game 
I mean, they're still in the game. Uh -huh. And the way we're going to be drilling in Alaska, continue drilling in Alaska, the way we've expanded uh, drilling sites all along the eastern seaboard, off the coast of Nova Scotia, right. uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. These are very difficult, high wire acts of, of mining for fuel. And the idea that we're going to continue, that it didn't brush us back at all. Right. Yeah. Uh, and even in the debates when the two presidential candidates are arguing who's going to drill more. Remember that moment? Right. Like, oh, you, you've been drilling less. No, I haven't. I haven't drilled exactly. less. Exactly. I'm drilling it was, more. That was shameful, Lee. You're absolutely right. The, the Democrats should have taken some high ground there. But politically, again, it's a very, very tough one. It's the, because Republicans are spinsters. I mean, they take something like Solyndra, which, you know, when, in the grand scheme of things, the money we spent on Solyndra was a, a drop in the bucket. Oh, yeah. It was nothing. But they will take that and they will spit it. They will spit it. They will say, look, this is why you don't invest in, uh, you know, renewable energy. Yeah, it was a the, failure. And it works. But People then buy the it. left stands up against it with the spine of an arthritic jellyfish. Absolutely. So. And, and, it's, and it's depressing. So one thing that always uh, gets brought up by uh, critics of climate change, uh, people who say that climate change doesn't exist is, look, why is it that you guys are always trying to politicize uh, a, a very devastating event? They do the same thing when it comes to a mass shooting. A mass shooting happens, of course, advocates of gun control will speak out against uh, the fact that anyone can get a gun in this right. country regardless of their background. Um, and of course, they get criticized for being the bad guys because they're using a tragic event to make a political point. How can you make that political point and stomp on that criticism? I mean, you have to do it in a very aggressive and fearless way. Well, the right, the right does it all the time. They may, they'll, that's what the whole shock doctrine is. It's it's, yeah. it's the, the right will move in and institute their policies the moment a disaster happens. I mean, it is a, te it is a teaching moment that when, when something happens, you, you can actually pivot and change policy. And uh, so Sandy becomes uh, a moment for us uh, in terms of climate change. And similarly, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the world of these massacres. By the way, when you talk about, the, I think about the Gabby Gifford shooting, mm -hmm. which should have been a slam dunk for us to make some kind of, uh, right. uh, and there was absolutely none. I mean, if, right. if no legislative changes. In fact, uh, I was astounded how we were unable to bring about any kind of legislative change or even discussion. Well, you've, got to, you've got to get the will of the Democrats, right, in office. They're because politically, it's a very <laughs> tough, no, I mean, but yeah, the, de the Democrats are spineless. I mean, I think that the, at least on these issues that are political hot potatoes. Yep. And, and, and certainly, certainly the gun lobby is, is one of them. I mean, they're, they're afraid. Yeah, you, you call it, politi or, or they call it politicizing. I call it learning from experience. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. We see Sa Hurricane Sandy, we're like, oh, climate change. It's not politicizing. That's Learning from experience. So when it comes to disaster relief, you know, uh, those, some people would argue that it's not the job of the federal government to get involved in disaster relief. It should be the responsibility of uh, local government, uh, of the state. Uh, what do you guys think about that? And Desi, I want to start with you. All right. That's flat out bullshit. Okay. This is what federal government is for. When you have a multi-state natural disaster that sweeps out to sea the ability of that state to recover or to use its own infrastructure to help its people, to rebuild, to even help with immediate emergency response. That is why we have a federal government. That's why we all pay our taxes so that we can all help each other out when one of these problems happens. Yeah, if the federal government isn't going to come in at a time like this and they're not going to help, really, why is the federal government there? Just to wage wars, which are essentially huge employment programs that we run <laughs> overseas. And it's utterly, it's exactly. The, these local governments, there is no local government sometimes. Right. Because Tornadoes move through, hurricanes move through, and as you suggest, it, it, it's clearly a situation which the federal government's needed. And it's just dumb. Yeah. It's just stupid. It's just downright stupid, in my opinion, to have to, to basically cut government in such a fashion that you are not able to respond to disasters. You're not right. able to re to provide emergency response and then rebuilding from there. It's stupid because over the long term, it damages the economy. It just makes more sense to invest now in preparation and then in some somehow you know, working all together to help to respond to these disasters. It's just much better in the economy overall. We know this. This is the data. And you guys keep bringing up how it's much less expensive to do uh, prevention as opposed to reconstruction. And just to give you guys a specific, a specific number that I read in a recent report, for every dollar of prevention, um, we save about $14 of reconstruction. 
Okay, so it, it, it definitely makes more sense to put our focus in preventative measures and also to the whole point of the federal government being important when it comes to disaster relief. You know, because of climate change, we're now seeing extreme weather in areas that we typically didn't see it before. Um, so maybe the state wasn't prepared for uh, a hurricane in a particular area and, and having a federal government respond as a result yeah. of that, I think makes a lot of sense. And I think people don't realize it's not just extreme weather. It's like, what is half the corn crop dead this year or something Drought, like that? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah drought it's it's things that people aren't even pointing to as often mm -hmm. and there'll be by the way there'll be a there'll be a lot more of that because these agricultural belts will be moving in response to climate change and this climate change thing is a big big deal and yeah. uh, you're, we're going to be dealing with it whether we want it or not uh, whether we want to be dealing with it or not on some level and that prevention is a, a, a is a massive step but politically, it's a very, very tough one. I think to cap that off, we can do it the easy way or we can do it the hard way. Mm -hmm. Right now, if we don't prepare, mm -hmm. we're going to do it the hard way. And what do you think? Do you think it's probably going to get to that point? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, in terms of we're going to continue to ignore it. Oh, yeah, as far deny. as that, yeah. as far as that, you know, no, who you knows? Think uh, I, think we, I think we live in denial as a absolutely. culture, I'm talking yeah. about. Absolutely. Yeah. We live as a culture in denial, but I think, you know, people are beginning to see these changes that have been predicted. They're hearing it. They're, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it takes being hit upside the head by a two before before you actually get mm -hmm. that this is a problem, but people are starting to get it, you know. Well, so. that's why I agree that Hurricane Sandy is a, maybe a turning point in awareness a little bit, but I think it's... It's not a turning point in terms of action, and I think it's going to take, we're, we're going to have to keep getting pounded. I it's hope not you're wrong. just going to be a moment that we turn it. <laughs> we're going to keep getting pounded. You're probably right, but I hope you're right. <laughs> All right, guys, we got to take one more quick break. Let's do that. And when we come back, the Mayan apocalypse, we're going to discuss the validity of those claims. Welcome back to The Point. Uh, the end of the show is near, but is the end of the world also near? I don't know. Uh, let's take a look at the next video that was narrated by Brett Ehrlich from Current TV, where he talks about uh, the Mayan apocalypse. According to the ancient Mayan calendar, the world will come to an end on December 21st, 2012 at precisely, oh, let's say noonish. Or maybe it won't. Apocalyptic prophecies have a pretty spotty track record, whether you're talking about William Miller, whose thousands of followers fervently believe that Christ's second coming would occur on October 22nd, 1844. Or Jim Jones, who predicted a global nuclear war on July 15th, 1967. Or Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate cult, who expected the Earth to be wiped clean on March 26th, 1997. Or Christian radio broadcaster Harold Camping, who predicted the end times would come on September 6th, 1994, then recalculated the date to May 21st, 2011, and then once more to October 21st, 2011. Or any of the literally hundreds of other doomsday prophets who told us the end was nigh when it actually wasn't. So do the Mayans have it right this time? And December 21st will bring, as REM put it, the end of the world as we know it? What do you think, panel? But answer quickly, because the clock is ticking. All right, I love the sarcastic tone of that video. It should have been sarcastic because this is a ridiculous topic. Um, but Lee, how, how do you prepare on, pre uh, how do you plan on preparing for the apocalypse? Uh, I've been working on my quads. Because uh -huh. this is a zombie apocalypse, there's going to be a lot of running. I don't know. Depends, I, I, I mean, everyone has their own story. So, so I've been doing that, I've been stockpiling lattes. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I, I think that maybe it's not that the end, that the minds were saying the end uh, w uh, is, is coming, but that maybe it, maybe it should. Maybe it was a recommendation for mankind <laughs> to tap out because you look around and you're like well we got you know super storms are hitting economies are collapsing around the world we got dogs in sweaters and kids on leashes I mean really is it isn't it about time that's so hilarious well, what does it say about our society though I mean you watch the news and every day there's at least one news story on the upcoming apocalypse right um, but you don't see as many stories about something that has real scientific backing something like I don't know climate change oh, I don't know yeah I know it's kind of sad and right. it's also hilarious that you know we went when we have the opportunity to talk about things that are actually real problems that nobody really wants to talk about that they spend way more time on the media the, talking about this kind of crap. And mm -hmm. it's unfortunate, but you know, I think 
part of it is that apocalyptic fiction is fun. You know, zombies are awesome. Who doesn't want to play with zombies? <laughs> and who wants to not be the only, be the last human remaining or the, among the, the merry band of people fighting that? I don't want to be the last human remaining. Neither <laughs> do I, right? The last one, yeah. maybe. It, it kind of reminds me of Walking Dead. I mean, I apologize to those of you who haven't seen that show, but as I watch The Walking Dead, if a zombie apocalypse were to happen, go ahead and take me. I'm ready to go. I don't want to survive. I don't want to deal with that environment. It's just that I'm not, I'm not interested in My it. My theory on why we're so obsessed with zombies is because we are kind of surrounded by them between people and their phones <laughs> wandering out into traffic. And, and now the corporations are people. They're kind of zombies just sucking up our, our resources. So. Well, you know, also I think part of it is that it's a lot more fun to talk about these uh, things that are never going to happen or that are just, you know, more, they have high stakes and they're very dramatic. And then, oh, you know, we're all going to get to be heroes afterwards because it's a lot more fun fun than talking about something like climate change, which is kind of like your mom telling you to clean up your room, and who wants to do that? Right. No, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, and the one, it, it's interesting, on this show, we've had <laughs> the real end of the world, because if, as you continue to crank the heat up on the globe, things are going to be more and more intense. People will lose their lives, their livelihoods. I mean, you're going to see, in a way, you're looking at the undoing of the planet. We've talked about it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's much more fun to talk about the vaporization of everyone at 11 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time on yep. the 21st, because it's, it's cool, it's magic, it's weird, the Mayans, they're cool, remember how smart the Mayans were? They had all the math figured out and it's all gonna come to, it's just a, it really is a more fun, dynamic exercise and plus, we don't really believe it, so it's even more fun to talk well, about and it. It absolves you of responsibility to do anything. Or, or, the res or the responsibility to do something is a lot more exciting, like shooting a zombie in the head rather than turning your lights off. Exactly. <laughs> not driving, See, not driving an SUV. Yeah. So yeah. Reuters just recently had this uh, poll, and they asked uh, people whether or not they believe that the world is actually going to come to an end on December 21st. One in ten people said that they believe it. Now, Lee and I had a bit of an uh, argument about this. He doesn't really buy the poll. Um, so I don't tell know if I buy why. it, but actually I did read, that, and this was like a year ago, a couple of years ago, that 48% of America thinks aliens have landed here, mm -hmm. like knocked mm -hmm. on doors. So people do believe these like crazy doomsday stuff. Well, I don't know. What's wrong with the alien thing? <laughs> I don't think. What do you say? I don't. I don't think that it. I don't no. think. No. I don't think. I, I, but it, it's kind of. It's kind of amazing though yeah. that that yeah. half of our country wouldn't be surprised if it like the beginning of Avatar. It said based on a true story. Right. Like <laughs> half the country would be like, yeah, that's, that's right. Well, well if it's a were, movie, yeah, it must be they, true. Were they gaming the polls then? Do you think the pollster who called and said that? I think that some maybe think. Oh, I think they f think it's fine. I don't know. I don't know. You think some people were just joking around, had like joke answers? I mean, how many people? If, if one in ten people are stupid, if one in ten, people, really, are stupid. If one in like, ten people believe that, would, wouldn't one in ten people out on the street right now not be wearing pants? Like, why? Mm -hmm. Why? You got three days left, or whatever it is. Well, I, I, there are, I think that people could possibly believe it, but they're just kind of like covering, uh, you know, uh, uh, or covering uh, from themselves for themselves in case it actually doesn't happen. And I will say one thing: it's gotten a lot of play. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to. Or is it just collective fun? Maybe it's just a really guilty pleasure. We all like to talk about it, but it's got a lot of play. I mean, it's uh, to get this kind of media play, you'd think somebody must be buying into it. Otherwise, why are we giving it? Why are we dignifying it with with anything? Uh, Did you, know, you just uh, suggest that the media only covers dignified <laughs> no, no, no. and, and no, no, respectable no. topics? I'm suggesting that the media covers things that people sort of tip their hat to. So they there must the be zeitgeist. right, right. They follow the zeitgeist very well put, as usual. Desi says it. <laughs> Yeah, Honey Boo Boo got some coverage. <laughs> you know, People love Honey Boo Boo. Yeah, you brought up a good point, though, in, in when we were talking before the break, that that why did people spend so much money on Black Friday then? Why were the sales? You know, why would you buy so much if you know you're one of the ten if there's people? There's no Christmas. That, yeah. Right. Well, you want to you want to enjoy the goods. Look, I think most people that go shopping on Black Friday do go shopping for themselves. You know, I'm sure so they do buy a few Christmas gifts here and there. But people are going out there to buy the electronics, the big item, the big you know the big purchase of the year, like the TV. They're not buying that as a gift. Just and in they don't case get the ninety minute, yeah. they, they but, don't get the ninety day warranty though. They don't worry about that because they, they know they don't have to. Ironically, exactly. watching Black Friday makes me wish the Mayan were right. Yeah, <laughs> that's really funny. Um, all right, uh, so uh, let's talk about the profitable side of uh, this apocalyptic thinking. Right, there's so many reality shows now that are dedicated to these 
crazy people that are preparing for the end of the world. Um, Doomsday Preppers is one of those shows that, um, right. you know, it's, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure once in a while as I'm channel surfing. And it's amazing. They spend a huge chunk of their income on building these underground bunkers and like oh, buying yeah. all these products. So this is a bit of a conspiracy theory, but do you think retailers are kind of like pushing this idea so they can get, you know, the wackier people to buy their products? Definitely. Survivalist <laughs> storage sheds where you can, yeah, that's, I think there should, they should, there should be doomsday prepper storage wars. You put Ooh. the two together, so you wow. have to design your doomsday barn, but only from stuff found in a storage, storage container, war. okay? <laughs> so do you like this? So stay with me. I'm just, out. anyway. This is uh, the second show idea you came <laughs> up with, man. Always <laughs> thinking, always, always thinking. Kind of, yeah. But you know, Glenn Beck is already doing this. You know, he talks about in his right. online show now, you know, he goes on and on and on about how we're on the verge that the country's going to end and the world is going to fall apart and you want to be prepared for the economic collapse. Right. So here, buy my seed collection. Right. Or here, <laughs> buy my doomsday prepper thing. You know, right. I have yeah. something I, ready I, for I you. Think Fox a, News for a while actually had ads, maybe it was during his show back when it was on had ads for the seed like apocalypse garden or Here's whatever your apocalypse like, kit mm -hmm. Here's your right. you know Here's no your right. totally totally they, they make so much money off the fear stuff you know every time you flip on these the, the, the news broadcast be afraid be afraid holy shit be afraid and then every commercial do you have anxiety <laughs> <laughs> we have pills that can fix that for you well you know and also have you ever noticed that that all of these uh, doomsday preppers you know and the whole concept of you know what you're going to do after the apocalypse are you prepared is that in the end it means that the rednecks rule because mm -hmm. they're the ones that you know we're prepared we know how to hunt and shoot and kill animals and, and dress them and we, we don't need engineers or doctors all we need are to, you know our own guns and we'll be all just fine but uh -huh. the, the scary side of this though I think is that people now get whatever information they want so that True. there's so many shows saying like I, I've met smart people that believe that alien dinosaurs are still alive among us and are like running us as an experiment or something because there's like hours of it on the Discovery Channel about how dinosaurs may have been put here by aliens and and so people find this crazy information and then can find anything to back it up as long as they aren't actually yeah, researching what's real. Yeah, people definitely do cherry pick which news they want to consume and yeah. believe. So they find the message. That's absolutely true. And then yeah. and so they end up preaching to the converted on all of these different things. That's probably a very good point. All right. So uh, last ridiculous question on this ridiculous topic. <laughs> um, let's assume that we have solid proof that the world will end on the 21st. What are you going to do on the 20th? What is the last activity you do before you die? or before the apocalypse. I guess you could attempt to survive, but. I was gonna come to the show with you guys. I thought that'd be. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. This is the most fun I've ever had in my life. That's right. All right, this all right. It. I don't know whether to be uh, <laughs> proud or extremely sad for you. I think it's a great time for a party. Uh -huh. Get all of your alcohol together and drink it all up because that stuff should not go to waste. Oh, good point. And whatever else stuff you have. I feel like we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves because we spend so much of our time talking about how to fix the world. And we're like, oh, well, it's just over. Right. All right, yeah. where's, the, where's the Jameson? Right. <laughs> where's my righteous indignation when I need it? Yeah. Right. What yeah. about you, Mike? I think some comfortable clothes and maybe, a, maybe a, uh, an adult beverage or something. And uh, I have to actually work um, on the radio in Los Angeles Great. on... Uh, on the 20th and the 21st, mm -hmm. so. All I can tell you is if the end is coming, I want you to narrate it. Thank you. Yes, there you yes. go. Oh, I want that'd, that be a, that'd be a great gig. You just won't really be able to talk about it after you've done it, but, um, <laughs> but a great final gig. Just I, as I, long as you're saying kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> they book right. a bigger celebrity. That's the way it goes now on, uh, on narrations. But, right. um, but yeah, listen, Anna, happen? I hope that we're going to be around for a while because I, I hope to be back to visit you at some point. Oh, definitely. I love, I love doing the show. I love talking with smart, intelligent people such as yourselves. And uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, so we have to wrap up the show. But I do want to thank you guys one last time. Lee Camp, uh, tell the audience where they can find you and what you're working on. Uh, I have a, uh, it's a free web series called Moment of Clarity that I do every week. It's at LeeCamp.net. I'm also, for just a limited time, giving away my comedy album, for free download at leecamp.net as well. Oh, damn, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, all right, Desi Doyen, uh, tell us a little more about yourself and what you're working on. Well, you, know, you can listen to the Green News Report, our syndicated radio show. That's at greennews.bradblog.com. And you can follow me online at on Twitter at Green News Report. 
And, uh, you know, we cover all the environment and energy news that you don't generally get to hear about. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a free podcast, and uh, you can hear it on progressive radio stations around the country. It's pretty damn scintillating. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's I have good. to say, she's good. I she have to is say good. She's good. Um, every, every time the topic of the environment or anything about science comes up, I'm like, I want Desi Doyen on the show. <laughs> I mean, I have like a, this is sexual harassment, sorry, but I have a girl crush on you. <laughs> You're amazing. Um, all right, and Mark Thompson, tell the audience where they can uh, hear that radio show. Uh, it's KFI on. in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, it's a it's a fun place to sort of have a fun time with some uh, some current events. And I'll be there on the, for the end of the world on the 21st, also the night before on the 20th. Also uh, uh, here on the Church Network once in a while I show up. And I've got a couple of other things in development. Uh, in the, are we wrapping up? Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes. Anyway, and I'm giving away free uh, copies of Lee's comedy album. Also. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot for, for letting me join you. Thank you for coming on. And also, I want to make sure we thank our contributors for this week. Uh, our point contributors were Tom Hartman, who you can also check out at TomHartman.com, as well as Naomi Klein, whose terrific book is Shock Doctrine. I'm sure you guys are all aware of that already. It's The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. And also, if you're interested in participating in a more upbeat event this December 21st, friend of the point, uh, Lisa Klaper is... Uh, helping to organize demonstrations of unity with flash mobs, group meditations, and ceremonies at archaeological sites around the world like Stonehenge and Chichen Itza. For more information, visit unify.org. I'm Anna Kasparian. Thank you so much for watching The Point, and we will be back next week with another great episode.